Hello and thank you for joining me. And Happy New Year! Is the winter weather getting you down? Well, today we are going back in time to last summer, when I was in the south of France for some virtual sunshine. We will be taking a look at Pisa la Dier, a famous dish from Nice with roots in Liguria. Southern French cuisine is known for its unapologetically bold flavors, and Pisa la Dier is no exception. The dish is made of a bread foundation, traditionally a dough similar to focaccia, which is then topped with caramelized onions, anchovies, and olives with some herbs and garlic for good measure. It is very popular in the southern part of the country, with almost every bakery having some version of it available. Some people get excited about getting croissants when they visit France. For me, Pisa la Dier is the apple of my eye. If I stop at a bakery, I have to try one. They are not all created equal, however, especially depending on what time of day you get there. But lucky for you, I will show you how to make your very own, very delicious Pisa la Dier. And that's not all. Not only will I show you a traditional recipe, I will also show you a slightly more elevated version that I learned from my time at the Provence-inspired restaurant King in New York. First, let's start with the traditional version. As mentioned earlier, it is based on a bread dough similar to focaccia. I have here some bread flour, yeast, salt, and honey. I'm starting by measuring out two and a quarter cups of flour, about 280 grams. Then I've got about a teaspoon of salt and two and a quarter teaspoons of instant dry yeast. And then I bust out my very tiny whisk and get those dry ingredients all mixed up. And now for our liquid ingredients. We've got 150 grams of warm water. And if you are in a kitchen without a scale like I was, that's a little over a half a cup or about 10 tablespoons. Now I've got a little glob of honey, which won't make the dough sweet, but it will just give our yeast a little boost. And I've got a couple of tablespoons of olive oil, which I measured with my eye. Now I just give that a whisk, and then I pour it into our flour mix. Now I use my hands to bring those elements together into a cohesive mass. If it feels a little too dry, don't be afraid to add a little splash of water, but don't go crazy because the dough will hydrate a little more as it rests. Once the dough comes together, I get it onto the counter with a little flour and I knead it for a good 10 minutes or so. You will notice that the dough becomes more smooth as you go. Once the dough has become smooth, I work it into a round ball. And then I put a few drops of olive oil in the bowl we mix the dough in, using my hands to coat the bowl with the oil. Then I pop that dough into the bowl cover it with a towel, and we let that stand at room temperature for about 30 to 40 minutes. In the meanwhile, we can work on our onions. I have here five pretty decent sized yellow onions, and I just want to peel those up and slice them thinly. To peel the onions, I like to slice the root and stem end off, and then I cut the onion in half and peel out that outer papery layer. I like to do this for all the onions before I start slicing because it drives me crazy to have a little bits of peel or root tendrils on the cutting board when I'm trying to slice them. With all those onions peeled, I go into slice mode. When you hold a knife properly and keep the other hand positioned correctly, you can do this part very quickly and safely.
With all those onions sliced, I get a pan on the stove over medium heat, give myself a splash of olive oil, and then I go in with all those sliced onions. I also give them a good pinch of salt and a few grinds of black pepper. Then I let those cook over medium heat, keeping an eye on them, and I stir occasionally. Checking in on our dough around the 30 minute mark, we can see that it has doubled nicely. Now I deflate that and work it back into a ball. And then I return it to the bowl to rest until our onions are ready. While our onions are finishing up, let's talk about the other toppings. We have here some nice oil cured black olives. Normally I always use olives with pits and then I pit them myself but I bought these pitted olives by mistake. Please forgive me. And the other important topping, we have our anchovies. Back in the pan, our onions are nearly cooked enough, so let's talk about the last components of the onion mix. Pisa Ladiere often includes herbs. I usually add thyme, but when I ventured into the garden, there was no thyme to be found. But there was plenty of rosemary and sage. They both grow like weeds down here so I figure it would be appropriate to use them. I pick a little of each. Back inside, I pluck the leaves from the stem of the herb. And then I give them a good chop. And with those chopped up, we drop those into our onions. Rosemary and sage are both woody herbs, so it's nice if you give them a chance to cook for a little bit and fully express their aromatic potential. Speaking of aromatic potential, I'm also adding a few cloves of garlic that I chopped up. And I stopped recording, but you only need to cook that garlic for about 30 seconds. And then you can turn the pan off and put the onions, herbs, and garlic mix to the side. Really quickly, I just want to set my oven to 220 degrees Celsius or 450 degrees Fahrenheit. Now let's roll out our dough. This kitchen didn't have a normal size whisk, and it also doesn't have a rolling pin. However, there were multiple empty bottles of rosé, so that's what I'll be using. I'm just doing my best to roll that out into a rectangle shape that is about half an inch thick. Don't hesitate to use your hands to help achieve that rectangle shape at the corners. Now, just for the sake of presentation, I will go ahead and trim the edges of the dough a little bit. And now I transfer that rectangle of dough onto a baking tray. Then I take my onion and herb mix onto the dough and apply it as evenly as possible. And once we have our onion layer down, we go in with our anchovy fillets making crisscrossing diagonal lines across the top. Once we have an attractive grid, we take our olives and place one in each of the diamond shapes left between the lines of anchovies. Mmm, 
looking good already. Before we bake, let's just hit the edge of the dough with a little drizzle of olive oil. And now let's get it into our oven. All ovens are unique, but expect to bake it around 17 to 20 minutes, or until it looks like this. The dough has baked to a beautiful golden brown, the anchovies have rendered out a bit, and the onions have browned a little on the edges. Now let's get that onto a cutting board. Portion it up as you like, but I tend to prefer bigger pieces. Let's get one of those pieces onto a plate and let the food in the atmosphere do the work for a moment. So there you have it for the fairly traditional version of Pisa Ladiere. Now let's take a look at the version I learned while working at King Restaurant. This version replaces the focaccia type bread base with a rough puff pastry dough. This results in a final product that is super flaky and crispy. It's a little more indulgent and perfect as a small bite for a special party. Let's start out by making our dough. Knowing how to make a rough puff pastry dough is a great little skill to have in your repertoire. There are countless recipes you can make with it, so write this down for later. Back in my home kitchen, I am equipped with a scale, so I first weigh out 300 grams of flour, about two and a half cups. I give that a good pinch of salt and whisk it up. Next, I go in with 50 grams of cold butter, about three and a half tablespoons. Now I break that up into the flour. You can use a pastry blender or a fork, or even your hands. I'm trying to break the butter up into small pieces before we add our water, basically in the same manner as when you make a pie crust. Now I have here some ice and some water, and now you've got a recipe for ice water. I just want to sprinkle in some of that water as I mix with my hands. Adding a little more until the dough comes together into a relatively cohesive mass. Once it can hold together, I get some plastic wrap around it and give it a last little disc shape. And then I let it rest in the fridge for at least 30 minutes. This is our base dough. Now we can talk onions. The process for this recipe is similar to the first recipe with a couple of distinctions. This time around, we will be using red onions. At King, we only ever used red onions. I'm not sure if it was a philosophical stance or just what they chose to order, but it was always red onions. So in keeping with that tradition, you will see me slicing red onions here.
And just as before, we get a pot or pan on the stove over medium heat. Give ourselves a nice glug of quality olive oil. And then we get those onions going. Another unique aspect of the king style pisciladilla is that we would cook the onions a bit longer than you commonly see. This really adds a depth of flavor and sweetness from the caramelization of those onion sugars. I love that flavor. I think the more mediocre bakeries out there will often skimp a bit on the onion browning process because browning the onions requires more time and, well, more onions. And time in onions is money. But the result is gray onions that are more sweated than caramelized. Still tasty, but true browning is hard to beat. While those onions are on their way to caramelization, let's keep working on our rough puff pastry dough. I have here 120 grams of butter, which I have frozen. I also have a small metal tray and a box grater that I was also keeping in the fridge. I will take that butter and shred it on the box grater. Once all that butter is shredded, I even it out on the metal tray and pop it back into the freezer until I'm ready for it. Checking in on our onions, we're about halfway there. Don't be afraid to drop the heat a touch if it seems like they are trying to burn, and make sure to scrape up that nice brown fawn that accumulates on the bottom of the pan. Back to the dough. I take our base dough out of the fridge and get it onto a work surface. Using a little flour and a real rolling pin, I work that dough out into a rectangle, maybe something around 10 by 18 inches or 25 by 45 centimeters. But you don't have to be overly precise. This isn't Cunyaman after all. <laughs> Once I have that approximate rectangle formed, I pull my shredded butter from the freezer and I put half of it on the bottom two thirds of the dough, taking care to space it out evenly. Then I bring down the top third of the dough over the middle third and give the butter on the bottom third a little press so that I can fold it up over the middle third without the butter spilling out everywhere. Then I rotate the dough a quarter turn and roll it into the same size rectangle as before. Don't be afraid to use your hands to square up those edges if need be. Then we do the same steps as before. Using the last half of that frozen butter, we cover the bottom two thirds of the dough. Fold the top third of the dough down over the middle third, bottom third over the middle, rotate and roll out to the same rectangle shape. Then we do one more fold without adding any butter. Now we just need to wrap this dough up and rest it for about 30 minutes and it will be ready to use. I know this seems maybe a bit fussy, but don't be intimidated. It's not too difficult and it's so much easier than a true puff pastry. Now it's time to par bake our pastry. After our dough has rested, we cut it in half. That's all we will be needing for this recipe. See how those butter layers kind of look like puff pastry? With a little flour on our work surface, we work that half piece of dough into a rectangle about the size as you did when we were folding in that butter. Maybe add an extra inch of length and width because the next step is to trim the edges of that dough. Now we get that dough onto an oven tray and we use a fork to dock the dough or prick the dough all over. This helps the dough rise more evenly during baking. Once the dough has been pricked, we get it into an oven that has been preheated to 200 Celsius or 400 degrees Fahrenheit and we let that ride for about 15 minutes or until the pastry is lightly golden brown all over. With our pastry half baked, we can now follow the same procedure as with the traditional pisciladilla. We cover the pastry evenly with the beautifully browned onions. Then we make that iconic crisscross pattern with the anchovies. 
It's worth noting that doing the crisscross fashion is not entirely necessary. Most of the bakeries I've been to just scatter everything about, but it just looks so nice. Next, I fill in the gaps with the olives. And this time around, I had access to some fresh thyme, so that's the herb I will be utilizing. Then I give it a grind of some black pepper. And because we were always generous with the olive oil at King, I give the pisciladiere a nice drizzle of olive oil. Mmm. Again, it's looking pretty amazing already. But before we can taste it, we need to pop that back into the oven for another 15 minutes or so. And now, we are in business. Like before, our olives have shriveled up just a touch, and the anchovies have gotten a little frizzled on the edges, almost like rendered bacon. Mmm, this is good stuff. The only thing left to do is portion and taste. I'm going for bigger pieces again, but this works great as a little one bite amuse-bouche. And if you can believe it, I'll give this one last little drizzle of olive oil. All right, just for quality control. I think I need to get involved here. Mm. I hate to abuse a cliche, but it literally melts in the mouth. And the sweet, savory combination from the onions and the anchovies is surprisingly balanced. And if you're a little intimidated by anchovies, know that after baking, their intensity is significantly reduced. So there you have it. A classic from the south of France, in two different ways, traditional and slightly elevated. Thank you for joining me today. I hope you enjoyed diving into the salty influence of the Mediterranean for some sun. And as always, I hope you give it a try yourself. We try to put a lot of love into these video projects, so show some love back by hitting that like button. And if you're a newcomer, we would love to talk you into a subscription. And of course, leaving a comment below also helps us to stand out amongst all the other fishes in the sea. Until next time, cheers!